Good evening, everyone. I think that we are still waiting for a couple of people. Um, but while we're waiting, I, I quickly want to share my screen and just start with the introduction. Uh, that might not work. Okay, okay, okay. I can't share my screen. I wanted to show you a photo of um, myself and Dr. Itai, who you can see on your screen there on the right. Um, so I, I had the privilege of spending some time with him in Israel early this year. Um, I spent some time with him in his clinic. And together, we kind of did some Ivan here. And he showed me all of the amazing cases that he, he's been doing. Um, and he really got me excited about, about Ivan here. Um, just to introduce Dr. Ivan to you guys. Um, well, first thing is, he's a really cool person. He's an awesome person. Um, I, 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 I just I thought that it was amazing to see a dentist that is just passionate about people and that wants to give back and that wants to help. Um, one of the first things that he said was he wants to give everyone the opportunity to smile, um, which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, Dr. Itai qualified in 2003 at the University of Buda in, in Budapest, in Samuel University, and he has since uh, worked in Tel Aviv in his own private practice. He developed Ivania um, as a product, so he's the inventor of this product. And I think that you guys launched it last year, is it not? Did you launch the Did you launch Ivania last year? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, okay. Yeah. So it was launched last year, so it's brand new, um, and I've been working with it for about, well, since June, basically. So I've been working with it for quite a while and I'm really enjoying the product. Um, so just a short introduction from my side uh, on the actual product. It's, for me, it was actually quite a, a jump to, to see that this product can uh, like revolutionize injection molding. So I'm used to doing injection molding. I'm used to doing digital smile design. And there's so many products that we see that can and go. And the last thing that we as dentists want is to just see another fad. Um, and that was my initial worry that this is just something that we're just going to come and go. But I can truly say that this product has changed the way that I do injection molding in my practice. It's made things simpler, it's made it quicker, more predictable, and I can spend more time finishing and polishing the veneers because I spend less time building and, and actually creating a shape. For me, that's one of the main advantages. It's not a one-size-fits-all veneer matrix. It is something that you can still customize to fit with your patient's face and exactly to the, to the length and to the shape that you want it. So this is something that you have full control over, which is also a great advantage. One of the other advantages that I really like about the product is the fact that I can easily use it with rubber dab. Now, those of you who have done injection molding before, the moment you place a rubber dam and you do injection molding with a conventional silicone matrix over a rubber dam, it becomes very tricky to actually fit the, the silicone over the, the rubber dam. 
And that for me was one of the main advantages of actually using Ivania because I can easily use it with rubber dam. So that opened a whole other door. But the way that it made the biggest impact in my practice is that I could do dentistry at a lesser rate because I spent less time and I could help more people to fix their front teeth, which is pretty amazing. So I almost created a whole other type of um, market in my practice. Um, it's, it's, it's not for everyone to do ceramic veneers. Not everyone can afford it. And sometimes we just need an effective, simple, predictable solution that we can do on the day. Um, and that's, that's where Ivania has really made a big difference for me. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to you, Dr. Itai, to, to do the lecture. I'm looking forward to, to learning from you. It's nice to see you again. Thank you very much, Holly, for your kind words. Uh, thank you all for watching this. Uh, for me, um, before I will start the lecture, I want to say that uh, uh, for me, uh, doing uh, composite veneers or doing an edit dentistry is uh, something that uh, I find uh, very uh, useful. I find it useful for me. I find it useful for the uh, patients because um, for me, uh, when you cut uh, a 20 years old child, cut the teeth uh, for doing uh, ceramic veneers, this is, uh, this is not acceptable for me. So um, um, there's nothing, um, in my opinion, that beats uh, composite bonding when it comes to restorative dentistry. Okay, so let's uh, start the, the lecture. Uh, this lecture is about eye veneer, injectable matrix system. Um, and we use mostly flowable composites, so we are doing restoration or we, we restore with flowables. <coughs> Okay, so I am here together with the uh, right uh, millionaires partnership, restoring with flowables. So what is the reality of today's dentistry? The reality of today's dentistry is that resin composites are used more and more in the daily routine. So dentists uh, prefer uh, to... It's a, are, you sure, are you showing your screen at the moment? Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Can you see? No, we can't no. see your presentation. Okay, just a minute. We can only see your Windows screen. So maybe it's a different screen that you're sharing. Just a minute, okay. Your screen is mirrored and not um, on presentation. Okay, can you hear it? Can you see it now? Yeah, that's it. There we go. Okay, sorry, sorry for the delay. Okay, so uh, this is a partnership between Ivan and Right Millionaires. Uh, I will speak now about the uh, what is Ivan here, the injectable matrix system using flowables. Uh, so, what is the reality of today's dentistry? The reality of today's dentistry is that dentists rely more and more on resin composites than they used uh, to do uh, before. Um, additive dentistry, uh, additive adhesive dentistry is now preferred by dentists and patients alike because patients don't want uh, their dentist to cut their teeth. Uh, they would like to do something which is additive, something which is uh, um, 
uh, not destructive. Also, the rapid innovation of composite materials in the last two decades, since uh, 96, uh, when the uh, flower composite arrived, um, uh, we, have, we can see now various of, uh, types of composites uh, that can give clinicians an extremely convenient and cost-effective tool for their practice than ever. Also, the direct composites allow the clinician uh, to, uh, to do a work of art. The clinician understands that he can uh, uh, manipulate and he can control the material and he can uh, do a work of art. Before we start, I want to show you a quick live video, okay? And I will explain during the video uh, the case. So uh, let's start. This is a, in this uh, video, I will show you uh, how I replace a broken ceramic veneer with uh, the eye veneer matrix. So let's start. Now you can see that the teeth Okay, you can see now, uh, this is a tooth number 21. Uh, I used, uh, I did a ceramic veneers uh, many years ago and the tooth the number 21 was broken. And you can see uh, that after I removed the veneer, I took the eye veneer matrix, I just set it on its place. And in very fast injection, in this case it's B1, a flowable universe of flowable composite, I inject the material, I cure the material, take off the matrix, and as you can see, there is a shiny surface. It's almost a perfect uh, composite veneer. What's left to do is only to do a finish and polish, and it is done. The patient asked me, please doctor, I don't want to do another ceramic veneer. I don't have the money to do it. I want to do it fast. I want to do it now. Can you do it? But I want the quality to be uh, almost as good as the ceramic. So I suggested him to use the eye veneer matrix, and he was very happy with it. Before and after using eye veneer, this is uh, some, some uh, clinical uh, uh, pictures, uh, uh, pictures from my clinic, uh, what I can do with the eye veneer matrix. You can see that I can do a uh, cheap teeth, or broken teeth, this is before and after. Diastema, I can fix diastema. Multiple diastemas as well. So what are we looking from our restorations? First, we want our restoration to be aesthetic. We want that to be durable. We would like the procedure to be fast and cost effective, of course, for us and for the patient. And Patient satisfaction. We would like the patient to be happy with the results and also us. Simplicity is the key word here because we want to simplify things. And I really believe that if we simplify the procedure, uh, we can do a better dentistry. We can uh, be more relaxed. And our procedure should be predictable and repeatable which means we can predict what will be the outcome and we can repeat it all the time. Not like with layering technique, that this is a very good technique, but it requires a high skills and the results are not as predictable and as repeatable with the idea. Copy paste, injection template mode. What does it mean? It means that if you look at the picture, you can see that uh, we, you have the, uh, uh, the a kid, three or three years old kid, who plays in the sand. He creates this castle, this nice castle, only with the template, which is this uh, pot that he has. How we do it? He doesn't have the skills, but he has the pot, and this pot has the shape of the castle. So he push the sand inside, take it off, and you can see uh, what the creation he did. So. Actually, he doesn't have to have hand skills. 
He just has to have the templates or the tool that will help him to do it. Today's dental bonding techniques, what do we have today? We have the freehand layering technique, which I will discuss soon. We have the injectable silicone mold technique, prefabricated veneers, and we have now uh, the new prefabricated injectable matrix, the eye veneer. When we look for aesthetic, which option should we choose from? Let's talk a little bit about the freehand layering technique. What are the disadvantages of the freehand layering? So we are very limited with our hand skills. It's time consuming, long learning curve. The result depends on our skill and of course, smooth. It is not predictable and repeatable. And it is very difficult to achieve symmetry and anatomy. For example, in the case of the polydiastema cases, but there are also advantages. And I believe that freehand layering techniques should be uh, your first uh, in order to have some experience later on. The advantages, we can work with increments. Uh, we can allow for incisal uh, effects. We can control proximal contours. And of course, we can allow rubber down placement. What kind of matrices, which are the, our tools for freehand techniques? So you have the Toffenmeyer, you have the so-called uh, Unica matrix, you have the spoons, the polycarbonate spoons, like the Uvenir or the Myvenir. You have uh, uh, transparent sectional matrices uh, from uh, BioClear in this case. And you have the uh, Milo Strip that all, we all know. And of course, we have the sectional metal, metal matrices, which I uh, use sometimes together with the Ivanir. Prefabricated composite veneers, as you know, if uh, you had a chance to use it, I had a chance to use this uh, prefabricated uh, composite veneers uh, many years ago. Um, the uh, companies, uh, or the other wise, I find it uh, quite, for me, uh, uh, frustrating and uh, difficult to work with because you have to understand that in this case, you have to know how much to cut from the teeth, and you have to know how much to cut from the inside of the composite veneer in order to fit them together. It is a very challenging uh, uh, process. For me, it didn't work. Maybe um, you uh, uh, do better than me. So it is not a custom made for each patient. Uh, you have really have to, to understand how to fit it. And most of the time it can be bulky because the amount of the composite that you have to leave and the reduction of the teeth uh, will make it a little bit uh, bulky. And it is not for every situation. And the cost for the patient is quite high. The injectable silicone mold technique, as you can see many pictures here, uh, many uh, stages, many uh, uh, things that you have to do in order to uh, create these uh, this, uh, veneers. So you have, of course, to have several meetings. Uh, you do not control the final result. Uh, you need several visits. Uh, you need lab work for the wax up and the silicone mold, and there is a cost for it. The learning curve is, uh, is quite high. Uh, it is not a chair side, of course, and not for a small emission. So, you, you won't do it for one teeth. It is difficult to isolate the rubber down, as uh, Dr. Corny uh, we discussed uh, earlier. And uh, it is designed mostly for uh, monochromatic. With Ivanir, for example, it is a chair side and you can use it even for layering technique, which I will uh, teach you. What are the direct resin bonding advantages? So, of course, it is conservative, minimal invasiveness, uh, I try mostly to do a uh, minimum or no preparation for my cases. 
it can be long lasting if you do it in the correct way. And very important is that dentists control the technique. We really control the technique. It's not something that we uh, take an impression and order from the uh, technician and we get the final uh, product. We control the technique so we can change it during our uh, treatment. It requires skills, of course, uh, but the patient and the dentist benefits a work of art, which is something very important for us. And there are many, many mock-up advantages. So why to inject? This is a, a picture of uh, the eye veneer uh, and the syringe. Um, when we inject, we get a smooth and predictable workflow and protocol. The anatomy is excellent because the whole anatomy is built into the matrix, into the template. We don't have to think. It's easy to implement and teach because the learning curve is very small. We can avoid misunderstanding with the patient because we can show the patient what, we did, what will be the result at the end before we do the final treatment. And we can verify aesthetic, occlusion, and phonetic before the final outcome. So which composites do we use for injecting technique? We use mostly the universal floral composites, or the high field, or the nanotechnology, or the next generation. We can use also a warm paste conventional composites, if you would like. Now, there is a myth that floral composites are weak. So what, is it true or what's new about it? We have to understand that since 96, the composite material, their uh, physical characteristics improved very much. Floral resins uh, composites were developed in 96. And since then, uh, and in this area, the filler particles were, was very identical to the conventional hybrid composite. It was quite big. The first generation was introduced to simplify the placement and techniques to increase the range of clinical application for resins. But still, they had a poor clinical performances because the filler range was less than 20%. Later on, the introduction of the nanotechnology came and the new generation of the flowable nanotechnology composite arrived. The nanotechnology composites have increased physical and mechanical properties for better adaptation, elasticity, and polymerization. So we decided that, of course, it is better to use the next generation for injecting flowables into Ivanir. And we see the results. You can see some abstracts and some uh, clinical data, empirical, uh, independent uh, data that shows that flowable composites have a uh, flexural strength and uh, 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 elastic modulus, which is similar and sometimes better than the conventional composites. So clinical benefits of the universal flowable composites are good handling, insertion and manipulation. We can manipulate the composite with hand instrument. We can inject the composites. They have good elasticity. They have high exotrophic properties, which means that we can move the composite with our hand, tip of hand instrument. A very good color stability. They can adapt very good to the internal cavity walls. They are strong and wear resistant. And their polishability retention is very good. Also, radio opacity. And mostly, they are suitable for all restorative indications. 
So what, according to these studies, we can understand that the recently developed specific nano-hybrid fluorazine is good and sometimes even better the conventional. We can also use the uh, conventional composites with a heater, the composite warmer, and can inject it. And why we do it? Because most of you uh, use, I guess, they use the conventional composite materials and they uh, think that the conventional composite materials are better with color retention and elasticity and uh, strength, mechanical strength. And this is okay because uh, to convince you that the flower composites uh, are as good as the conventional, maybe it will take time, but you can also use those composites that you are used to, you can hit them and uh, have better flowability. When you hit the composite, you will have deeper polymerization and the composites will be stronger and harder. There will be a better color retention if you warm them, a better adaptation, and of course, you will decrease the voids, which is very important. So what are the restorative indications for flowable composites? We can do anterior and posterior applications. We can use them as sealants, as a composite for preventive dentistry, emergency repair of uh, fractured teeth, fabrication, modification, and repair of composites, prototypes, and provisional restoration, mock-up, tooth splinting, repair of fractured ceramics. I use the flowable composites. Uh, of course, with a special kit of uh, ceramic repair. Sometimes, if I need, um, I just uh, do a, a, a composite a veneer on top of, an, of the ceramic if I don't want to replace the teeth, if it is in the aesthetic zone and the patient don't want to uh, cut back and uh, replace the crown, I do it and the results are very good and last for a long time. Uh, we can eliminate of, uh, also uh, cervical sensitivity and more. So let's talk a little bit about the eye So this is the matrix, as you can see. Before I will talk about, uh, um, go deep into eye I want to show you a case, um, what we can do with eye um, This is a clinical uh, video. Uh, of me uh, demonstrating uh, MOCA, which is a very powerful tool for closing the treatment plan. And this patient came to me and she wanted to do uh, a MOCA. She wanted to do a composite veneers. She didn't want me to cut her teeth. Uh, she wanted to do, uh, to change the uh, appearance of the uh, uh, six front teeth. And she wanted to change the color and the shape. And as you can see, tooth number 21, uh, and it's a little bit uh, discoloration uh, from uh, orthodontic. So I suggested her to do a composite veneers with eye veneer, and I want to show you before we did the treatment, before she accepted the treatment, how I do a uh, mock-up. So let's see. <laughs> In this case, I don't do uh, edge to bonding, no perforation. Of course, I don't care about the proximal, I cut the wings and I just close with my hand the small opening in the palatal area. I inject a very, um, this is, in this case, this is a extra bleached uh, color. And I clean it, I light cure it. I clean the excess, of course, I light cure. And I will finish curing. Of course, I suggest you to cure twice than you used to because of the uh, matrix. I remove very gently the matrix. And as you can see, you get immediately uh, almost perfect veneer. There is a small dot inside. You can uh, 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 put a little bit of material and close it. 
it depends on your technique. You have to go back while you uh, injecting the material, go outside, go back, and then inject. And then I do a little bit uh, finish and polish. You can see that the surgical area is perfect. And after I finish to do a little bit finish and polish, I can show the patient the result. I specifically choose the very uh, bleach color because I wanted to show the patient the differences. Go a little bit for the gum line. And as you can see, it's shiny already. And this is because of the closed system. The matrix creates a closed system, so there is a polymerization of the last layer. Now I take it off. Remember, I didn't, I didn't glue it. I didn't do uh, etching and bonding. So a small part is, was break, broke there, but it doesn't matter because I wanted to show before and after. And this is a powerful tool because if you can show the patient so fast what will be the results, usually they accept it and they want to proceed with the treatment. So, what is Ivanir? Ivanir is the only prefabricated chair side, of course injectable matrix on the market. It is a patent protected. So it is prefabricated, it's the only one that you can inject inside and it is a chair site. Which means that you can take it from your uh, uh, desk and you can just put it and just inject it. You don't have to order it from the technician. It is a true template. Why it is a true template? Because once you put material inside, it will retain its shape. You don't push it and it doesn't change the shape while you're injecting. You don't create pressure on it. So it retains always the same shape. It is anatomical morphology of uh, real dentition. We have different sizes and shapes. You don't need a lab. It's only single injecting technique. Actually, the injection itself is this is uh, so fast, um, so you will be really uh, amazed. Less than a second. It will reduce your chair time, and you don't have to rely on your hand skills. You have to understand that, uh, of course, we are dentists and we have to uh, understand what we're doing, but. You really can be very confident and relaxed while you're doing the procedure and um, you will reduce uh, your tension and your burnout. And it is a very uh, amazing tool for trying in purposes as I showed you. So what is the design? This is the matrix and as you can see the matrix have uh, the front area or the buckle area, which has the anatomical, the anatomic shape. And this part, uh, uh, the buckle area of the matrix is 0.2 millimeter. So it will retain the shape. We have the cervical area, which goes half a millimeter into the gums, a very important area. So it also has the uh, emergence profile of the natural teeth. We have the stalk or the hole. This is the injecting hole through which we will inject the flow of the composite. And this area is very important. This is the interproximal area. And this area is the, the, the area which will go in the contact points. And this is 0.05 millimeter to 0.06 millimeter. It is very, very thin. The thinnest that you can do with a, a medically graded plastic. 
in this case, of course. So we have also the wings. You can see uh, the sign of the numbering of the teeth and the size. The wings is for holding the matrix and manipulating into the place. Sometimes we can cut the wings if we want to work wingless. This, is, this technique is called a uh, cut wing technique. And uh, I will explain you when we use it. And the matrix itself will create a closed system once we put the matrix. And if we need, we build a palatal shell, we close everything. So when we inject the material, it will be with pressure and no bubbles. You can see again the parts of the matrix. And this is the kit, the Eigner package. It contains two kits. And uh, we figure out that uh, at the moment we, uh, we go only for a triangular shape. And what is the reason? Because from triangular shape, which is the most common one, we can go to in, into a valve shape and uh, a little bit more square. We just have to use our um, uh, finish and polish uh, discs. These matrices have the anatomical shape from tooth, uh, natural teeth. So we have the orange one, which is the large one. We have eight injecting matrix templates or matrices uh, in each box. Uh, each of the kits contains uh, 64 matrices for tooth number numbering uh, 5 to 12 or 14 to 24. So this is the aesthetic 8 front aesthetic zone D. And we have the green kit, which is the small one, uh, I would say small medium even, the same 64 total, uh, eight front aesthetic zone teeth. You can see it here as well, how we number it. So the ease of the technique, the technique, it's a very simple and fast technique. You have to pick the matrix, you have to, if you need, you have to manipulate it by cutting the wings or cutting partial of the wings or no cutting of the wings at all. Minimal prep or no prep usually. Of course, you have to start with uh, selecting the case. Insert, inject. Once you insert the matrix, sometimes you need to close the palatal area and I will teach you how. Sometimes you don't have to touch it at all. You make sure that the matrix sits uh, in the correct uh, position with uh, enough space for the composite material, for the flowable, and you inject the material. Less than a second, it will be filled. And then you cure, of course, and you finish and polish. Also, finishing and polishing is very minimal. So what are the advantages of the eye veneer? First of all, it is accessible to all. It is a, we have a very minimal learning curve. You don't need to use, a, or you don't need to have a very super high skill freehand techniques. Although you might use the eye veneer with a very simplified uh, layering technique that I will teach you. You don't need the lab work or costs. You will reduce the chair time, definitely. And overall, you will increase uh, dental practice revenues. It is for wide indications for all dental practice. It is safe, comfortable, and it will expand your treatment offers. Of course, it will reduce over overhead practice costs. I can tell you that I can use uh, one syringe of flow of composite with eye veneer, I think with one syringe of uh, 1.7 gram, uh, I can do between uh, 10 to 12 composite veneers. So what is the protocol of eye veneer? The protocol is a very simple one. Actually, uh, it's the same for all um, 
conservative uh, treatment with, that we do with uh, composites. Um, we isolate, of course. In this case, I prefer to isolate with the Teflon. I rub the Teflon with my hands and I push it underneath the gum without even injection. As you can see, there is a bleaching of the gum, which means that this Teflon is um, expanding inside the gum and it will uh, block or it will uh, prevent uh, bleeding and it will retract the gum half a millimeter apically in this case. We prepare or we minimally prepare the teeth if needed. We choose the right matrix from the kit. We try it. We cut it if we need. We manipulate it. We can work on it. We can manipulate it. Once we uh, figure out that it sits, everything is okay, this is what we need, we take it out, we etch the teeth, we bond it, of course, light cure, put the matrix again. If we need, we close from behind. Palatal shell will teach you how to do it without index from the technician or you doing indexes. I call it a freehand index. And we inject the material and we like cure it. You have to cure it twice than normal because of the uh, matrix. We peel it off and a little bit finish and polish. So use cases. What can we do with eye veneer? Or what can you do with eye veneer? You can do pig laterals. You can do chipped or broken teeth, class four, grinded, abraded, or erosive teeth, it's very good. Multiple diastemas, discolored teeth, tooth uh, after root canal treatment, or after, uh, uh, or when you, uh, you uh, build a, a composite crown. Misaligned teeth, which are not requiring orthodontics, I do it a lot. Um, it is very good for mock-up purposes. And also it is an alternative to ceramic veneers. Or alternative, or as a, a provisional before ceramic veneers. This is a little bit more advanced, but you can do also composite crown after uh, endo treatment or if you remove a ceramic crown and you don't want to continue a ceramic crown, I can build a composite crown because I control the technique, I can get a very good results. Uh, you have to make sure that after the uh, endo treatment, uh, there is a fiber post of course and not a metal post. And you can use it as a temporary or long term after implant, if you do, a, if part of you are doing implants and you need, a, a, you do, a, a, you need a, a crown, a temporary crown uh, after immediate implant, implant, implantation. Sorry. So uh, what you have to do is you just put the adapter and you build a palatal shell on the abutment and then put the matrix and inject the whole material and this is a very very good uh, provisional very fast provisional for those of you who are doing immediate implants so um here i want to show you a case and really i would like to emphasize that i'm not trying to show here uh very fancy cases uh that you know that I have to take pictures for uh, half a day. No, I, I just show you cases that I uh, do very fast and, um, and I uh, film with my phone and everything is from my phone. I don't cut it, I don't edit it. And um, this, is, uh, this is the reality. So I want to show you a case of a composite crown. And why? Because this is a very interesting case that you can do with eye veneer. This patient came to me and he told me, listen, doctor, um, I know that I have a gun recession, the tooth has a mobility type two, 
course, I told him of him to me. And, uh, but I want to retain the teeth. I don't want to extract it, and I don't want to replace it with a new crown. Can you do something else fast? Because I don't have the money and the time for it. I told him, of course, I can do a composite crown, if it's good with you. And I will show you how I do it uh, very quick, very fast. And I want to show you too. So this is the result after. And what I did, first of all, I took out the crown. There was no metal post, or if I remember, there was a very small part of it. I did a small preparation. Of course, I uh, cut a little bit from the incisal because it was uh, elongated. I bonded it, cured, and then this is a free hand palatal shell technique, and you will use it a lot when you do uh, eye veneer. So look what I do. I draw the shape of the palatal area. It doesn't have to be exact one, but I have to make sure that then I can put the matrix and it goes all the way. In this case here, I use a block with a paper I put a little bit dent in shade, A, O, 3 in this case. And now I can try again the matrix. In this case, because there is the diastema, I don't cut the wings. I close from behind. And while I'm closing from behind, I create a closed system. And while curing it, I also fix the matrix to the place. And now take a look. I do a mixing of two shades. And why? Because his tooth has kind of mixed shades. I peel it off, remove the matrix, remove the excess. I, I could handle this excess better if I, would close, I was uh, closing from behind better. But I remove the excess. A little bit. Finish and polish. And this is the end result. And this patient is happy till today. This is an advanced case, but even as an advanced case, I think it's quite simple. So this is the before and after. Some other cases uh, before and after using eye veneer, and as you can see, multiple diastemas. Again, building the palatal shells. In this case, you don't build the whole palatal shell, you build only the proximal areas that are missing and the incisal area that are missing using the eye veneer. On the lower jaw, um, this is a free hand. Again, free hand when I don't, because we are planning to uh, be soon with the uh, lower arch, but this is a free hand uh, flowable. I tell you, this is uh, much harder than uh, when you have the templates. This case is a severe tooth wear. And I wanted to tell you that these cases of uh, erosion, erosion and, uh, uh, and abrasion 
for me are the most uh, simple uh, cases because as less as, as I have teeth, it's easier to put the matrix and to inject it. You just have to build the palatal shell, put the matrix, inject, and you know, take care of the proximals a little bit, finish polish. This is a small lateral peg shape. In this case, missing the number 12. Misposition, not requiring orthodontics. These cases are very nice. Um, I like them very much because all you have to do is those teeth which are located palatinally, you just have to remove them buccally. So this is additive dentistry. You don't subtract, just add composite. Of course, you build the palatal shells and uh, then you put a matrix and you just add the material. And these are the results. Uh, in the case of cheap teeth, um, when we want to keep the diastema, so of course we can keep the diastema, then we don't cut the wing, we let the wing go all the way through the diastema, keep it the palatal shell, and then the rest with the matrix. Uh, this is a case of stained or darkened teeth. Of course, we remove the old composites, we clean the teeth and uh, we put the matrix and we inject the material, finish and polish. Crowded centrals. I want to talk about this uh, case. Uh, when you have a crowded uh, centrals and one of the centrals is overlapping the other one, and when the overlapping is not exaggerated, a very small overlapping, you can manage this case because if you will use a very thin diamond bear and you will uh, you will create the midline so you, you will uh, reduce from the from the uh, tooth number 21 a little bit and then you will create the midline it will be very easy to continue because those proximal areas of tooth number 21 and number 11 is only for additive dentistry so you put the matrix inject the material and you add once you put the matrix you have to make sure that the proximal areas will have enough space for the, for the material. So I like very much these cases. This is uh, basically additive dentistry with a small enamel plastic. Again, um, in this case, class five, also very simple case. It's just, it is a class five with elongation of the incisal area of uh, number 21 and 11, of course, you clean all the uh, uh, cavity, uh, you prepare a little bit the tooth, you build a little bit the uh, uh, incisal area with a freehand flowable, and you put a matrix and inject the rest. Traumatized teeth, as I told you, as long as the tooth are more traumatized, to fix it, it is easier. And why? Because immediately when you build freehand palatal shell, you create the wall for the other layer. In this case, you cannot inject a single shell layer because, uh, because the tooth is missing a big part. And if you will continue only with the mono shape, which is not opaque, you will have some transparency through the uh, composite and it can be a grayish and you will see actually uh, the buildup. So in this case, you have to do a very thin, very thin palatal shell. And on top of the very thin palatal shell, of course, you have to do a beveling, a correct beveling, and I can teach you how to do it. And a very thin a denting opaque shade which will cover half of the beveling, and then put the matrix and inject the rest of the final layer. This color teeth, in this case, and this is the only case, when I prepare like I prepare for ceramic veneer. Why? Because I have to block. 
I have to block the discoloration. And usually I use a pink opaque uh, after the preparation to block the discoloration. On top of the pink opaque, uh, I put uh, dentin shade, which is uh, um, A2 or A3 opaque. And on top of it, I put the final layer. This is the case of uh, one of our uh, attendants to the uh, uh, hands-on in Israel. Um, you can see um, that after the first uh, hands-on, uh, dentist, which is, uh, you know, just finished the university, uh, not a high skill dentist, but he really wanted uh, to learn a new technology. He uh, came to the uh, hands-on and the day after he sent his picture. And I think this is uh, quite amazing that uh, young dentists can uh, do such a work uh, after one visit on an oil. Challenges. There are some challenges and you will learn how to solve them uh, because it's very easy. The matrix doesn't go through the contacts. What does it mean? It means that you're trying to put the matrix and it doesn't go through the contacts. So it means that you have to open a little bit or to separate the contact points. So you have to release a little bit the contact points in order that the interproximal area of the matrix will go through. Sometimes I cut the, the wings and I leave only the interproximal area, which is very thin, and I push it very gently through the contacts. If I need, I open a little bit, but I don't let the matrix to squash. If the wings are squashing, it means that it is very tight contact. So open a little bit more or cut the wings and use another technique, which is a sectional matrix holding the eye veneer. And I will show you. When there is an open palatal area, if you put the matrix and you take a look from behind and you see that the palatal area is open, you should close it. Closing the open palatal area is quite fast. You don't need to order an index from the technician. I usually use a so-called freehand palatal shell. There are several ways to close the palatal area. Either with a flowable, freehand flowable, just putting a very thin layer of flowable from behind and not stuffing inside, curing. Either the next uh, way you can do it, you can just draw on your glove the missing part, adhere it to the, to the palatal area and cure it. Or you can draw on a minor strip the missing part, put it from behind and uh, cure it. Or before you put the matrix, you build the palatal shell freehand, either with your glove or with the miter strip. You try the matrix. If it is too long, the matrix won't go down, won't go all the way down to the gums. You cut back a little bit from the incisal area with the disc and you try again. Once the matrix go all the way down, so you are good to go and you continue with closing from behind, curing, and then injecting the whole composite. What's happening, what happens if the excess composite material is running out during injection? It means that you didn't close from behind, which means go again, check the palatal area if you close it, check the approximate if they are open, just a little bit composite, flowable composite, uh, work with the silicone brush, for the excess, cure it, and then you can continue. If the matrix is too small or too big, just change the matrix. Matrix manipulation, when and how. Manipulation means that we can cut the matrix. It is not a stiff polycarbonate. It is not a stiff uh, medical grade plastic. So you can manipulate it, you can cut it, you can adjust it, to the patient because each patient is different with his teeth. Sometimes you cut the whole wing, sometimes you cut both of the wings, sometimes you cut part of the wings, sometimes you don't cut. For example, when, do, when I use the whole matrix to the wings, when I have diastemas that I want to retain, 
So I need the wind to go all the way through the diastema. Or if there is a gum recession, in this case, gum recession, bone recession, so the wings can go all the way down. So if I feel that the wings are interrupting with putting or uh, uh, sitting the matrix, then I know how to manipulate it, cut it, and I sit it um, in a way that it will, will go all the way down. And remember that the interproximal area will close and won't be open. The diastema control is very tricky. I suggest you when you do diastemas, multiple diastema mostly, is first to build with the comp with the matrix the whole teeth, and then you take the sectional matrix that I uh, uh, told you before, the sectional metal matrix, a very very thin one, goes with the Teflon, and close the gaps again with the flowable. You just put after, if there is a small gap remaining after you do everything with the eye veneer, you put this interproximal, in the interproximal, the metal matrix, push it a little bit to create a contact point with your finger, inject the flowable and with the silicone brush, finish and cure. This will give you a very good tight contact point. What about the color? So, in the beginning, I told you that we can work with eye veneer monochromatic, and when you work monochromatic in cases that there is a natural enamel from the palatal side and dentin that can block the color. But what about cases that there is a big missing part of the teeth? For example, in uh, traumatized, broken teeth, a class four. First of all, we have to build with a very, very thin layer, the palatal shell. Personally, I do it with uh, enamel shape. It can be adult or it can be a uh, juvenile enamel shape. And on top of this enamel shape, I put the dentin layer to block. And I don't put the dentin layer till the end of the incisal area. I can create the mammalons, I can shape them, I can uh, draw them. A little bit part of the dentin is covering half of the bevel. I cure it. I can put characterizations like white spots. And then I put the matrix and inject the final layer, which is not opaque. It can be A1, it can be B1, or bleach color, whatever you like. So this is a layering technique with Ivanir, but this is a simplified one. Isolation, I suggest you to do isolation with a Teflon cord, a braided Teflon cord, or you uh, twist the Teflon cord and stuff it into the gums. I use also a mouth opener as well that gives me a vision feel. For me, it is difficult to use a uh, rubber dam because uh, when I use a rubber dam, uh, I feel that I cannot see exactly uh, the shape of the teeth that I should, uh, the, the, the final result. For me, it is difficult, but of course, uh, you can try. Some tips and tricks. Polychromatic veneers versus single shade. So you can do a polychromatic, I explained it, and you can do a single shade. You can do a polychromatic veneers uh, if you do uh, the composite veneer in a way that you have to subtract from it later on. So you build more than you need. And when you build more than you need, you can subtract, you can create mammalons, and then you can do the final layer. So this is another way to do uh, polychromatic veneer. We talked about the isolation. We talked about the uh, 
how many ways we can uh, do a palatal shell. And in the case of a palatal shell, I want to give you a small tip. When I do the palatal shell freehand with my glove, I'm trying to touch with my finger not only the teeth that I want to do the palatal shell, but the teeth from the approximal teeth from the both sides. Because when I push with my finger, I really create the shape of the palatal shell. I feel the shape of the palatal shell with my finger. IPR with strips. I recommend you to do interproximal release, not with uh, very thick metal strips, uh, but with very delicate 0.05 metal strips. So you can control the IPR. I do not recommend to do the IPR with discs because this is very aggressive and not with burrs. It is aggressive. So you can do it very fast with metal strip 0.05 and you can control it. The cut wing technique, I suggest you to use, of course, scissors, but curved scissors. Because when you use curved scissors, you can control the shape of the cutting, which is which will be better than if you just cut it straight. Once you cut it, you have to make sure not to cut from the incisal area uh, and from the uh, cervical area, and not to cut the approximal area, the interproximal area. And once you cut, you have to make sure that your cutting uh, way should be in a curved way. So don't leave uh, uh, hangouts from the from the metal uh, from the uh, ivory plastic. So no undercuts. Don't leave undercuts. Composite crown. As I told you, if you do or decide to do a composite crown, please make sure that you build the palatal shell first on top of the preparation. Make sure that the palatal shell is thick enough so the uh, preparation won't be transparent through the shell. You need the palatal shell to be thick enough. And then you can continue with the pay and then the team, and then put the matrix and inject everything. You can mix the composites with two shades if you want to have a more polychromatic shade. Contact points. For the contact points, if you finish the process with the Ivanir and you still have a small diastema, no worry. All you have to do is finish and polish a little bit the proximal after you finish. Put a metal matrix, a very thin metal matrix. Push the metal matrix to the contact point with your finger. Inject again the same flowable of the final layer. Work with the silicone brush, cure it, and then finish it. My other pull technique is again instead of using the metal matrix, you can use a minor pool technique, uh, which you all, I guess, know. What happens if there is bleeding? If you put the matrix and there is bleeding starts and goes into the matrix, you have to stop. Controlling the bleeding is very important. You cannot continue injecting the material to be stopped with the bleeding. You have to stop, you have to control the bleeding, Put again the matrix, maybe put some wedges, and only when bleed, there is no bleeding and the whole area is dry, you can inject the material. So here I want to show you another, uh, another uh, clinical case uh, of, in my opinion, this teeth number 1323, the canines are the most uh, simple uh, teeth to do. Um, all you have to do uh, is um, to put the matrix, make sure it's on its place. In this case, this is another technique for uh, doing a palatal shell only with my finger. So I 
push with my or block with my index finger, I put my thumb, my thumb on the cervical area to hold it and push the material inside and the injectable, uh, the flowable material, and then I cure it. So look, I didn't use a palatal shell. I didn't use wedges. Only with my two fingers, I stabilized the matrix. I created the closed system, and I injected in less than a second. I injected the material. I cure it twice. Gently remove the matrix, and you will see a shiny, perfect veneer. In second, it is very important, and I suggest you, if the matrix sits good under the gums, and if there is a little bit excess, you can clean it with a brush. Please don't cure, leave the excess and cure it, and then work with a uh, 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 bear, uh, diamond bear, and the, the, the hurt the gums and let the gum bleed. Just clean with a very small silicone brush and then cure it. Do you remember this case? Yes. Now I want to show you what is the power of mocha. So this was before, and this was after with iVineer. So after I did the mock up, of course, she, uh, she, she scheduled the, the appointment and we did uh, six veneers, composite veneers, less than an hour. Here I want to show you, uh, again, a fast mock up on the tooth number uh, 11. Eventually I did uh, six uh, composite veneers. Very fast. Uh, this is not a mock this is not a mock-up, this is the actual uh, treat the treatment, sorry. I wanted to show you uh, the first how I closed fast the uh, palatal shell with my finger. And I blocked it a little bit with uh, composite double composite from behind. Then, of course, we continue the rest, but you can see the result very fast, very nice result. So this is before. And as you see, editing dentistry, we don't have to cut anything. And this is after. This is uh, the fingertip and layering technique, which I, I was talking about. This is very interesting, you will see now fast freehand palatal shell. First of all, I try the matrices. I, of course, manipulate, cut, try them. I do a very fast palatal shell with my finger because I uh, do a little bit cut back. Because there is, I want to elongate the teeth, I use an opaque little bit shade. I cure it, put the matrix, close from behind. Here I didn't close perfectly, so, uh, so when I reject it, a little bit uh, excess will be. In this case, I'm, I'm using a monochromatic uh, shade or a, a shade uh, from, uh, this, this one is a, um, one shade, of course. And then I put the second matrix. I close freehand flowable. This is called freehand flowable. This is the universal again, one shape. Has a chameleon effect. If I want to stay on the natural color of the teeth, I remove it a little bit finish and polish. 
and this is the result. Actually, it's quite nice one, very fast, very natural. So what is the vision of eye veneer? We want to simplify cosmetic dental bonding, okay? And we want the process for the dentist to be simplified, advanced, accessible to all people uh, in the world that they can benefit from it. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, are you going to go straight into the hands-on, Mitai? Or do you want to do a couple of questions first? Um, if they want, if they uh, have questions, of course. Um... I think maybe while you're setting up for the hands-on, um, if anyone has a question, if you can type it in the, the question box, then we can attend to any of the questions, if there's anything that comes up. while you're setting up for the hands. Okay, let me see. Oh, there's a, there's a very relevant question here. Is this a single-use product? Yes, it is. It is a single-use product um, uh, because, um, you know, uh, we believe that uh, it is not an expensive, uh, uh, I mean, each matrix is uh, less than $4 for the, uh, for the, for the dentist. And uh, once he uh, puts it in the mouth and he cuts it and uh, he manipulates it, uh, so uh, I guess uh, he cannot use it for another session. And again, if he takes it out, it will be squashed. But sometimes, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, sometimes uh, you can clean it, autoclave it, and maybe reuse it. But I think uh, it is not necessary. Uh, there's another question about in, uh, asking about the kit. How many matrices are in the kit? And what teeth do they extend to? Okay, so there are a total of 128 matrices in the kit. Uh, 64 for the large, 64 for the uh, small medium, and uh, these uh, matrices are for the aesthetic, upper aesthetic zone from uh, first premolar to uh, first premolar, so eight front teeth. So okay. actually you can do 16, 16 uh, total uh, eight teeth smiles with uh, these uh, 128 uh, matrices. Great. Uh, then there's a question about how do you ensure that you don't close the contact when you do the palatal shell? Again, can you repeat the question? How do you ensure that you don't close the contact when you do the palatal shell? Oh, of course. So when you do the palatal shell, you draw yourself the palatal shell. And when you put the uh, palatal shell, I, I can demonstrate it actually, okay? I can demonstrate it. Uh, Damir, can you see now? Yeah, it's a bit out of focus, yeah. Maybe it will come into a focus in a minute. Sure. Okay, is it now better? Yeah. Yes. So I take my finger, as you see now, uh, the incisal uh, area of uh, tooth number 21 is shorter, okay? For the purpose of the demonstration, I did it, uh, of course. I can put my finger from behind, and once I put the, my finger from behind, I touch the other two teeth, and in this way, I know that this is the correct palatal shell shape, okay? And then I can take the flowable composite and I can draw, I can draw the palatal shell without me touching the other teeth. I can see that I don't touch the other teeth, okay? 
Yeah. Perfect. And then I cure it. And once I cure it, I take it off. I cure it, I take it off, of course, and then I can put my matrix after I prepared it. In this case, I didn't prepare the matrix, but I will show it now, okay? I take the matrix and I know that when I put the matrix, it doesn't go all the way down because of the guns or because in this case, this is a, a Tifoden model. So in, it interrupts in the, in, with the interproximal. In this case, I will cut the matrix. And of course we have, we will release a clinical, uh, 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 an online course for everything I was talking today. I cut in a circular, half circular motion and I leave the interproximal and then I can take the matrix, put it again, and make sure that it sits in the correct way, buccally, incisally, and from the palatal, before I closed the, this opening before. And you please will excuse me because I forgot the curing light and you will kill me, but I will show you how without it, okay? <laughs> And this is the way we do it. First, we build the palatal shell, we cure it, we make sure that it doesn't touch the adjacent teeth, we work with the disc to have the exact height, like the uh, adjacent teeth, and it is better to reduce 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeter less then the adjacent teeth, so we can put again the matrix, sit it all the way down under the gums, and afterwards we check again, if there is a very small opening left, we can close it with a freehand flowable, cure it, we fix it while we cure it, and then we inject the whole material again. So while we inject the material, after we close everything, I can block with my finger, or as I told you, I can block from behind and cure it freehand. But let's say that I'm blocking with my finger right now, okay? Then I take the syringe. The tip should be in a way of almost 90 degrees because when we inject, we don't want to push the matrix with the tip and move the matrix. We want it to be very passive. We support with our thumb. We put the the uh, the flowable composite and we can you see the injection? We inject, 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 inject. Okay. Till we finish, and then we go out and we cure the material. Now, if we cure the material and we take out the matrix and there is still a small gap, then we can use a very, very thin sectional matrix. And we can put the sectional matrix in this way, and again, inject the flowable composite with the brush and cure it again. But once we put the sectional matrix, we push a little bit with our finger to create the contact if we need it. Okay? Any question? So there, there's a couple of there's a couple of questions that's come up. Um, there's a question about what type of material can be used, and I know that I mean I know that you use the GC universal the GC injection mold um, injection flowable. 
Um, but you can use you can use any universal flowable. So as long as it's a universal flowable, you can't just use any flowable. I think that's very very important to just state. Exactly. Uh, it, it's, exactly. It has to be a universal flowable. And what you want to kind of look out for when you, when you choose your flowable is to make sure that you have different options in, in your translucency. So you want to have a body shade and you also want to have an enamel shade that you can use exactly. um, because you want to play with different, different types of translucencies. Exactly. So, uh, me personally, uh, first of all, when we use flowable composite, and I mentioned it uh, in the uh, lecture, when we use flowable composites, we have to make sure that we use the flowable composite from the next generation. They have to have, must have, a high field, uh, which means that this is between 60 to 80 percent filler content, okay? So, most of the composites that uh, uh, we know uh they have they, they they should be called universal like uh, like this koyama for example that i'm holding if you read universal you know that you have the correct uh, uh composite and this is a great composite for koyama for the palatal uh, palatal uh, uh, shell personally i use um uh, a transparent enamel shade but you can use also the opaque shade this is good enough. Uh, I know, Corinne, that you use the opaque shade, right? For the palatal yeah. shade. Combination, yeah. A, com a combination. So this is good enough, but make sure that the, uh, the layer of the uh, palatal shade should be very thin. And on top of it, later on, you can put another opaque. And this opaque shouldn't go all the way to the incisal area, because if you want some characterization, you should put something which is transparent. So uh, half a millimeter before the incisal area, use the opaque, but uh, use also some transparent. Um, so yes, universal flowables, the Tokoyama medium uh, flow is a very good one. Uh, I use the, uh, the uh, GC uh, injectable um, because uh, actually uh, in my country, it is difficult to find the Tokoyama, but now uh, there is a dealer who brings it, so I guess I will use it uh, more and more because I like it uh, better. And also you can see that I use uh, from uh, Tukayama, I use also a paste composite materials. And why? The paste composite materials, um, we can uh, warm them and then use them with a gun or without. So actually you can take a piece of the uh, paste composite material and not just flowable composite and you can take a piece of it you can roll it you can put it into the matrix you can put it into the ma into the matrix as you see yeah and i can work with a silicone first of all I put it inside in a way that it goes all to the all places and then a little bit uh, modeling resin and then I stuff it into the uh, 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 prepared teeth, okay, in this way, into the prepared teeth, in this way, and then I cure it. And also you will get perfect results. So you can use it with uh, layering technique or without layering technique, but the advantage when you do this technique, it is like the um, so-called plastic spoons that you uh, push, uh, is that it won't uh, change the shape of the veneer. And it doesn't matter if you push hard or not, because the final result is not from the pushing, the final result is from the uh, template itself and excess material won't go out from the side, which means that if you do it and if other dentists do it, you will have the same results. So this is another technique. You can use a paste composite material, you can use a flowable composite material, and you can use a warm paste composite materials. Perfect.
Um, there's another question here about increasing the vertical of, of the anterior teeth. So this question is specifically about worn teeth. Um, there was another, there was actually two questions about increasing the vertical. The one question was about, do you, how long do you tell your patients that these uh, restorations last? Um, and then another question was about building up the posterior teeth. So how do you manage increasing the vertical of anterior teeth like that? Okay, so when you have uh, grinded teeth or erosive teeth, I know this is very challenging, uh, but what I do, uh, maybe I'm, the way I work is, is opposite from the rest. First of all, I build. Then I take care of the reduction or, uh, or the occlusion, okay? So this is my way, but I, I, of course I remember uh, that I have to uh, make some adjustment, sometimes to the canine for canine guidance. Uh, so I have to work on the canine. So I will have a canine guidance. Uh, I, I, uh, sometimes I do, uh, I put composites. Uh, so I, I, I increase the uh, occlusion vertical dimension with composites uh, to compensate. Um, and lateral movements, of course. But I build, I really, I build the, uh, I, I do the, uh, uh, the composite veneers. And after I finish the composite veneers, I start to work on the movements and I check the movements and I, uh, I'm doing reduction according to the movements. And for me, it works. So if I can maybe add into that, um, you know, it's, it's very, it's very tricky for, for us to, so if, if a patient has worn down their teeth, um, I think it's, it's kind of, we need to be careful when we add filling material, which is um, not a bio material, to teeth, and then expect that that will just last when the enamel and the actual dentine didn't. So we, we have to understand that when we treat worn teeth, we are treading on different ground here. Um, I would still suggest that when you treat the worn dentition, you have to adhere to the principles of treating worn dentitions. And it's not just, this is this goes beyond just doing a composite veneer. Um, then the principles of dentistry has to, has to kick in. So when we treat worn teeth, we can't lengthen teeth irrespective of what the occlusion allows for us to do. We have to understand what the occlusal, uh, occlusal limitations are. So my suggestion is, is really to, when you start using Ivania, don't just lengthen teeth. Start with a case where you don't need to actually add anything. Don't start with a worn dentition case. Start with a case where, where the, the length is, is probably going to stay the same. That's a very safe way to start with Ivania because you don't want to start with something that's actually quite tricky to manage um, on a completely different level. And this has got nothing to do with Ivania or with the composite material. This is an occlusal problem. So start with something simple and then work yourself up to, to, to going to cases where you can add length, but then remember the principles of occlusion. We can never forget the principles of occlusion. And that always stays the same. Exactly. Um, exactly. I totally agree. Um, uh, yes. Another question was about interproximal finishing. So if we look at uh, interproximal finishing, do you ever use an interproximal finishing strip? Um, the interproximal finishing, it depends. If, if I uh, finish the process and there is a good uh, contact point, so I use, you know, I use just a, 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 a finishing strips, okay? That's what I do. But if there is, uh, for example, I, I know that after I do a multiple diastemas and I finish the process, usually I do interproximal finishing with a very uh, 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 light discs, not abrasive, okay? And then with uh, finishing uh, strips, and then I can put the other layer and do with uh, metal uh, uh, sectional matrix. And again, finish it, check for the contact, and then do another finishing uh, strips. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think with any sort of injection molding te technique, 
Um, interproximal finishing is probably the, the area that's the most difficult to manage. But what I actually found, which was for me one of the greatest advantages of Ivania versus the conventional injection molding, is that I actually got a really nice smooth finish already with the with the matrix. Where with injection molding, sometimes with the excess, there's so much that you need to that you need to clean up interproximally that's like slightly just a little bit of excess, which makes it much more difficult to clean and to finish interproximally. Um, but I agree with you, using a like a very thin interproximal strip, you get really, really thin ones. And my suggestion is to go from the thinnest, so go with the thinnest strip first, and then to go to, the, you can normally get, get four different thicknesses with, with interproximal finishing strips. And don't don't try and force a thick strip in there. Do the thin, thinnest strip first, and try and get the most um, finishing that you can get with the thinnest possible strip. Because the and inevitably you might open up your contact if you if you use the interproximal if you overuse the interproximal strips. Yes, don't push uh, metal strips and, uh, and and use very aggressively. And you, as a uh, as a dentist, who works with uh, with the microscope. So I guess that you can uh, really see that after injecting into the uh, matrix, when it goes all the way through the contacts uh, in the right way, uh, it will be already finished after you cure it. Yes. Uh, there's a question about the no, non-prep technique. Um, they ask if what you do to the teeth. Do you only etch or do you roughen the enamel? What do you, how do you treat the, the enamel? Um, First of all, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm cleaning the teeth. Uh, if there is some uh, carriers, I remove the carriers. I work with uh, silicone uh, brushes. And then uh, what I do, uh, um, I work with the aluminum oxide. And then I do the etching process. And uh, yeah, this is my, uh, my protocol. Yeah, I think as, as long as you, as long as you just clean the enamel, uh, that's completely, then, then you're completely fine. You don't have to, to do any reduction on the enamel. We just, aluminum oxide is probably the best thing to use there. Uh, let me just see if there's any other questions. Oh, there's a question about single unit units, uh, so like uh, refills. Are there refills available? Yes, of course, there are refills. Uh, the refills are, can I, I will show the refill how it looks like. So, uh, uh, actually, uh, you can buy a refill. I recommend, of course, to buy the whole kit because once you will have the whole kit, uh, you won't find yourself uh, without the matrices. Um, and the refill is uh, for uh, just uh, when you finish the one teeth, you can just refill it. Um, these are the refills. You can find it, uh, you can find 10 pieces of the same teeth and uh, they are available, small and large. Perfect. Then there's a question, I think this is a very important question. There's a question about closing of the matrix. Um, yes. So the person said that they don't really understand. And I think this is probably one of the most critical things to really understand about Ivanir is to get that perfect closed system. So, Itai, if you can maybe just go through the process of closing the matrix again. Yes, so once you put the matrix, uh, once we put the matrix, we have to understand that we would like to create a closed system. And why? Because we are going to inject the uh, composite with pressure. And once we inject the composite with pressure, we don't want excess to run out of the matrix. So this is why we want to close the palatal area. And sometimes, sometimes we need to close also the approximate area. So as you see here, there is an opening, a small gap opening. If I will inject now the material from the buccal area, the excess will go out. So if the, uh, uh, if the opening is very small, of course I can block with my finger in it if this is okay. But if the opening is big, we have to build the palatal shell first, and then we put the matrix, and then there is maybe will be a, still a very small opening. We will block it freehand 
with our flower ball without pushing it inside, we will cure it and we will take a look again from the proximal areas, for the proximal area from the palatal, if there is no opening. If there is an opening, we will block it again, very gently. We can put also if we want, or if there is, sometimes there are gaps, so we can put a minor strip just to make sure that we don't touch the other teeth, or we can put a metal uh, sectional matrix that's just to make sure that we don't touch the other teeth and cure it. And then uh, we make sure that after we cure from behind that everything is sealed. The only opening will be the stalk, the opening from the stalks. So when I will push the material now inside and uh, inject it, it will fill the, uh, the, the, the uh, area very fast. If I push the composite, and I feel that I push and I still can push, it means that something is open and when you will look from behind, you will see an excess. If you see an excess, you have to clean it with a silicone brush, okay? Don't cure, don't cure it. Clean with a silicone brush and then don't cure yet and then push again, put your finger, push again the composite and then cure. Because what will happen if you will cure after the excess, it will be cured from the, uh, from the inside and you cannot push again the material. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. That's probably for me, that was the biggest learning curve is to be able to, to close the system. And something else that I want to add is, so the, I remember Itai when I was standing with you in your clinic and you were doing cases. There were a couple of cases where the moment you fit the matrix, it looks like it's going to be too long. Okay. Yes. But however, the, the width of the matrix is actually perfect for the teeth. And I remember the way that you, you know, you still filled up the whole matrix with flowable composite and then you reduced it. Okay. So I think it's important for people to understand because I've already had questions from people in South Africa, from dentists in South Africa, about my matrix is too long. So I think it's important to understand that that's not a problem. Exactly. You just have to make sure that you can close the palatal, you create your closed system, and you will build then a long tooth. And that's okay. And you can shorten it afterwards. If it's too that's short, the most, you will want you to have it. If it's too long, just cut it a little bit, that's all. Exactly. Yes. So it doesn't have to be, it, it's not always going to be the exact length that you need. You have to determine the length and that's going to be up to you. That's not up to the, uh, up to the matrix. You need to make sure that you have, you create the right length afterwards. So even if, if the veneer is slightly too, if the matrix is slightly too long, still close the system and then reduce it as you as you need to. Exactly, it will be so fast the, the reduction and you eventually you will see the result very fast. I mean, yeah. if it's too long, maybe it's one, one and a half millimeter. To, redu to reduce one, one and a half millimeter, it's very fast and you will see the result very fast. But you know, what I believe is that when the patient comes to the clinic and you look at the patient, you have to imagine the end result. You have to understand from the, from the point of view of aesthetics, what is the correct length, what is the correct curvature, how we should look or yeah. work, look at the end. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably the most important here. This is not, we don't want all our patients to walk out of the surgery and look exactly the same. We still have to be dentists and artists. Exactly. Um, there's a question. There's a question about um, isolating with Teflon. Itai, don't you want to just show them that do you have any Teflon with you, or you don't you? Yes, of, course, of course. So I uh, think your technique is, is really cool. If you want to show them how you do the Teflon. Yes. So um, you know, um, I'm lecturing a lot in, in in Israel, and I lectured in the Philippines now, and many of them ask me, "Don't you uh, <laughs> inject uh, anesthetize when you do the, uh, the, the this Teflon retraction cord?" And I say, "Never." So I don't know, do you, do you uh, anesthetize when you do a retraction cord, put a retraction cord? I don't know. I don't yeah, think, uh, you know what will happen if you will do the injection? 
the uh, lips will fall and while they will smile, you won't be able to understand the correct, uh, you know, uh, architecture. So for me, uh, it, it is a no, don't inject, you don't need to, okay? So what I do, I take the Teflon and I cut it into two. And why? Because if you will try to put the Teflon as is, it will be thick, very thick. So I cut it into two and then I roll it with my fingers. Can you see? I, I just roll it. It's not like this. It's like this. Okay? And then what I do, I take this Teflon, okay? And I just, with my thumb, I put it here. I, I touch the Teflon with my thumb and hold it on the gums. And with my next thumb, I just push it inside. And while I did it, now I'm holding with my finger, creating a little bit pressure, a little bit holding it, and then putting, pushing it under the gums, very gentle. So now this is because this is a, this is a, uh, a model, it doesn't go all the way down, but I push, I create a little bit pressure and then I push it, okay? This is the thing, and I release a little bit. So this is my technique. Perfect. I've tried your technique. It works. <laughs> um, <laughs> will there be more morphology options available in the future? That's an interesting question. Are you guys bringing out any more shapes? You know, we were thinking about it. And I would like to ask you, OK? as a practitioner, as a, someone who teach and as someone who uh, did the uh, cases. What do you think? Do you think there is a need for another shape? No. <laughs> so this is my answer because with the disc, I can just do whatever I want. Okay? Exactly. I can, I can play with the corners. I can play with the length. I can make the tooth uh, uh, broader or narrower. It's only a matter of playing with the, with, with, with the corners, okay? With the angles. This is all about, this is all about. You don't need really an, another shape. We just want the, lower, the lowers to be done. Just the lowers. You know, uh, this is a tool. This matrix will give you 90%, maybe more of the final shape. You don't have to deal with shape. You don't have to think too much. But yes, you are still a doctor and you still have a manual, some manual skills and you have to be creative. And, you know, uh, I see dentists that work with eye veneer and do things that I didn't think about. So you can be very creative and you can develop your own way of working. And um, it's, the learning curve is, is not too long, believe me. Are there any other questions, guys? I, I don't see any other questions coming up now. I'm going to give a couple of, uh, just a moment or two, if there's any other questions that come up before we before we sign off. There's a lot of people that's still on online, which is amazing. Thank you all for, for staying online. Um, I also just want to, to mention that if there are any questions about product specific, like pricing, um, that you can contact your Milner's rep. Uh, they will have all the information available for you. And you, I'm, I'm sure that they will, um, they have stock at the moment. So if you want to um, get some, some kits, it's a good time to order now. I don't see any other questions coming up. So I think that, let me just make sure. Uh, I will wait for, okay. People are asking for hands-ons. Okay. Okay, there is a question. What is a reasonable clinical fee? That's actually, that's a very relevant, that's a very relevant question. What's a reasonable clinical fee? Um, it's, it's difficult to now say because you, you're sitting in another country. Um, but if you can relate the clinical fee you charge for eye veneer versus the clinical fee for a ceramic veneer, how do, how do you compare those two? I would say that uh, 
the clinical fee for eye veneer is half of what I would charge for ceramic veneer. Okay, this is my rule. Yes. So, uh, you know, in, in Israel, for example, I, I charge for one composite veneer with eye veneer, I, I, I charge for uh, uh, almost $500, $500 US dollars. So, and the charge for a ceramic veneer is approximately $1,000. Uh, I think because uh, to bring the patient innovative material, uh, innovative tool, you uh, cut short the time that the patient sits on the chair and you don't bring in a couple of times and you finish the process fast, is something that a uh, patient should, uh, should uh, appreciate. And, you know, in my clinic, uh, they, they pay charge yeah I think um, as a just to give a kind of a relevant answer for the South African market I would suggest that you that you charge uh, the code that you can charge um, for our uh, dental codes is a composite veneer code I don't know exactly what the fee is for that code um, but you can charge a composite veneer code I charge more than the medical aid rate, and I also charge exactly the half of the the clinical fee I would charge for a ceramic veneer. So that's I think that's a very good rule. But you guys know that when we start with new products and when we start with the learning curve, it's always nice to kind of start with a little bit lower to try and find your feet. So I mean, if it's if it's something new, I don't think that it's that it's something. If, if you start finding your feet, it's, it's, it's nice to maybe do one or two cases that's not so expensive for your patient and, and just to get to know the product. Um, but I think uh, half of the clinical fee for a ceramic veneer is, is definitely fair. Um, uh, how long do you expect a veneer, a veneer to last, Itai? Oh, okay. So, um, you know, I, I tell the patient, uh, you. You meant how long it lasts, uh, the, the eye veneer? I mean, the, I mean. So the, uh, the actual veneer, the actual veneer, how long do you, do you, do you tell so, the patients that it lasts? Yeah, so I tell the patient that uh, eye veneer, uh, or not just eye veneer, you know, composite veneers, uh, last between four to five years before I have to touch it again or to do some uh, uh, refining, okay? But, uh, you can you can you can see some uh, because I do it I do it a lot and and all of you know it uh, some cheating might happen of course before these uh, five years uh, but I can fix it very fast and most of the time when there is some cheating it's my fault because I didn't do the occlusion in the right way um, but I can tell you if you really take care of the occlusion and because Ivanir is a closed system and when you inject it. Uh, you really polymerize all, and there are no bubbles in the polymerize all the, uh, uh, there's no layers even. So uh, I find out that uh, in, the, in the, the last uh, year that I'm working with Ivermeer, uh, the results are better, the color retention is better, uh, uh, the veneer looks uh, shiny uh, as ever before, and less chipping I have. So I really think that the, the, the number is five, four to five years, but even after four to five years, if I have, I don't replace them because they don't find the veneers on their pillow in the morning. Uh, and maybe I have to uh, just a little bit finish and polish. After a couple of years, I think this is acceptable. And I think I'm doing a good job for the patient for not destroying or cutting his teeth. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. If we, if we look to the research, if we actually look to what the science says, it, it, it says that we can give an expectancy of six years for, for anterior composites, which I think is more than fair, especially if you just do additive, because you're basically protecting the patient's teeth, which is actually amazing. So whatever happens afterwards, it's the composite that will fail and they, will, they won't chip down and wear down their own teeth more. So if you explain it in, in that way to a patient, they really understand that even if you need minor, and you do, you do need little touch-ups and you need to fix little chips over the course of a couple of years. 
uh, if you explain to them, they, they are completely fine with that. Um, let me see. People are asking more and more questions now. Uh, do all cases require minimal prep or can you do addition cases with no prep? I think that was already answers. You can, you yes. can do no prep. Um, yeah. Most of the time I do no prep or minimal, minimal prep. Really, I don't want to go to the dentine. I even don't want to cut the email in the enamel. But if I have a discolor teeth, I do it uh, as for uh, ceramic veneers because I have to block it. But I really, uh, my cases, and I have a lot of cases, uh, I stay on in my enamel, most of the cases. Yes. That, uh, that answers the next question as well, which is about fluorosis, which they're asking if this would be good for fluorosis. I think if there's something you need to hide, you need space for material. So if you need to hide something, color, fluorosis spots, you need space. So you might have to prepare or you need to add a lot more. Um, yes. I yes. Because, you know, it, it really depends on the patient. If there is a fluorosis, but the teeth are very small, okay, and I can do an additive dentistry and make it better, the aesthetic better with additive dentistry, so I don't have to cut anything. I just have to block it and add more. So, you know, if the tooth are, the, uh, are prominent, and I really, if I will add even a little bit uh, material, it will be more prominent, then really I have to take off a little bit and prepare a little bit. So, you know, this is uh, something that the patient should uh, understand and uh, accept or not. Perfect. Uh, I think that is it. Um, okay, the last question is about aluminium oxide particle size. I think the general consensus is 29 microns there, Priscilla. So you can use 29 microns for the preparation. Um, and I, it's, uh, what's the time there by you guys now? Uh, 9.30. Oh, is it 9.30? Okay, so it's not too, I mean, that's normal time for you. Tel Aviv is still alive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Early. <laughs> early. I'm going back to the now. <laughs> <laughs> You're still going to do two cases now. I know you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, um, everyone that attended the webinar. Thank you, Itai. Thank you, Damir. It was really nice to see your friendly faces again. Uh, and thank you to everyone that, that participated. It was a lovely interactive session, and I think everyone really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much thank for you attending. Much. Thank you, Dr. Point. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Perfect. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>